Hello and welcome to the first in a three-part series where we take a look at every issue of the original American Marvel Star Wars comic. Um, so I do have the full lot of these. I've absolutely loved it ever since the time of publication. Um, I've also got a few spin-offs, so some droids and Ewoks ones, and some overseas releases as well. So in this first video then, we're going to go from issue one up to, I think it's issue 38, just before they start adapting The Empire Strikes Back. So that's going to be today's video. So sit back, relax. And let's get to it. So here we go then with the very first Star Wars comic. Now I've actually got a couple of copies in this format. Um, this later one here actually comes under the uh, Marvel Movie Showcase series in actual fact. So if I just slip these out of the, uh, the Mylar bags so we can have a proper look at them. Um, so, well, this is this is the very first one. This is the iconic um, first adaption, first issue adaption of the movie. So, it took six parts to adapt it in traditional American comic book format, and uh, this is part one. There is a variation of this which comes with a thirty-five cent version, which I believe was done um, on a few select Marvel comics of this period. Um, that one is particularly rare. Um, I've not got that one, alas. Um, but this is the first edition of the first Star Wars comic, as published all the way back in. Well, it's got a cover date of July nineteen seventy-seven. Um, reprints are clearly marked second, third, fourth. I think this one even had a fifth printing down the bottom area here, just under these sort of uh, um, the copyright information. So that's the one to look out for if you are trying to get them all in first. Um, so we've seen this before a couple of times on the channel. I've got these in book form and uh, the tabloids as well. Um, it was such a great, great comic. Um, Howard Chaykin was the illustrator. Roy Thomas adapted the script. And um, it is what it is. It is the, the classic Star Wars movie adaption. And uh, we've seen it lots and lots of times. It's um, got period Marvel adverts for the 70s. Obviously, all the deleted scenes are actually in here. So um, Luke's meeting with Biggs, which was cut. The uh, uh, Han meeting up with um, Jabba is included in this comic adaption. It's great, you know. So from that point of view alone, they're worth having. Um, and certain themes, of course, were um, reused later on. So the problem that the Marvel writers and artists had was how to keep the story going once they'd ran out of content from the movies. So that's why as soon as, in fact, pretty much as soon as Disney bought um, the Star Wars franchise, they disowned and said everything that wasn't part of the movies and from now on, um, uh, or prior to this, was like non-canon. So they just basically wrote all of this off. But for many of us, this was what... Um, this was what we were brought up on. So that was a bit of a sweeping statement, to be honest. Um, this one here, this is uh, yeah, Marvel Movie Showcase. So this came out in November 1982. So there was still a market for the Star Wars adaption, even back then. Um, and does it do the whole thing or is it just... Yeah, this is actually... Yeah, this is actually just the first half of the movie. Um, so I would imagine there's a Marvel Movie Showcase number two, which will cover uh, the second part of this. Um, but there we are. So now copies of this um, and Star Wars comics in general shouldn't be as expensive as perhaps I think some of them are. Um, back in the late 80s when I was trying to put a run together of the American ones, when I would go to the comic marts in London, um, the Star Wars comics were in dump bins. I mean, they were they were cheap. They were they were being given away like twenty p a copy, and they had all the issues. Maybe not the first few, admittedly, but all almost all the issues, including the tail end ones, which are really low print runs. Um, dirt cheap, like twenty, thirty p a go. So I don't understand quite how they've become so expensive now. In so fact that you know the copies that are out there have ended up in collections, and. Um, you know, they're just maybe not coming on the market so often. But I mean, I did do a cursory look on eBay before I started shooting these videos. And um, well, you can get the whole lot there. Admittedly, 
you know, it would be, I've not seen a full run for sale and perhaps we could be looking at maybe a thousand pounds for a full set in, in really nice near mint to mint condition. Um, but you know, number one shouldn't set you back much more than about 30, 35 pounds for that. In fact, the British number one with its free gift of a push out X-Wing model is probably more valuable than the American one and probably ended up having a smaller print run because it was just for the UK. Uh, this was for all of um, the USA. Anyway, I won't dwell on that too much further in so much to say that I wouldn't expect to pay much more than five pounds a copy for any of these, except with the exception of the very last uh, few issues and number 107, which is particularly scarce. I think that had a print run of about 10,000. So that is genuinely rare, um, that last issue. But apart from that, they should all be fairly easy to get hold of if you really want to put a run of these together. So. Not a lot else to say about the first, awful cover that one, about the first six, because they basically just adapt in individual parts um, the original story. Now, you may notice that these ones here are actually the British Pence editions. Now, these are a slight variation. Um, like a lot of Marvel comics, um, well, from, from the 60s, in fact, um, they're printed at exactly the same time and exactly the same place, except the sense, the 40s, uh, cents or 35 cents has been replaced in this instance with a, a 12p uh, which is uh, denotes the British adaption but they're still exactly the same comics um, and it's just the British adaption. Some might say that the British adaptions are actually even harder to get than um, the American ones because it was just for the British run so you know there you go. Um, <laughs> make of that what you will but real collectors um, you know, try and get every single variation. So number one, for example, you could probably get 10 different examples of that, the different cover prices, um, the, the, the different reprints, as well as the foreign editions as well. So anyway, number six there, that finishes off the adaption of um, the original movie. And then for the first time, uh, Star Wars fans finally get to see something outside of the movie. Now, they started off pretty well with this. So it's actually a Han Solo and Chewbacca story. Um, and um, these guys go to a planet called Ab Abduba 3, where the, uh, the smuggler uh, leads a band of mercenaries against a gang called the Cloud Riders. Now, the leader of the Cloud Riders is um, a chap called Sergi X Arrog Arrogantus. Now, that name is particularly crazy because there was a famous mad artist called Sergio Aragones. And um, the even character even looks a bit like him. Um, so they've done that deliberately as a bit of an in-joke to uh, Sergio Aragones. Um, but, um, and he even resembles that character. So that's this first post-Star Wars story. And it's a Han and Chewy one. Um, I always remember this silly, silly rabbit with the big long green green ears and that um, did actually get revived um, a little later on by Dark Horse. They brought that character back for a bit of fun. So this one goes on for a few issues. Um, the actual artwork on this uh, changes. So Howard Chaikin was soon, um, uh, you know, he was working on other things. So from issue 11 onwards, the artwork varied between um, Rick Hoberg John Byrne, who later went on to do the X-Men comics, uh, Dave Cockrum, who did Captain Marvel and uh, X-Men and loads of other things, uh, Walt Sim uh, Simonson, he was most famous for doing Superman for quite a long time, and Thor, he did he drew those, um, and uh, Michael Golden was the last one. So that's the, the sort of the, the main artist who shared the chores. So the second sort of strip after the Chewy one was um, uh, you got Luke, Luke Skywalker teaming up with the droids. And uh, they face uh, um, watery doom as their as, as um, their ship lands on the planet Drexel, um, a planet which is on the brink of war and populated by large sea dragons. So <laughs> that's the next sort of storyline, which is uh, called Doom World. And so far, we've not really had any real classic covers. I wouldn't say yet. Um, so. Later on in the series, as we'll see, we get some absolutely beautiful painted covers, uh, but they, they've yet to be seen um, so far. So this one there, we've got Carmen Infantino, uh, cover art on that one. I have always been a fan of Infantino's work. Um, I actually got to meet him once at um, a convention in New York and uh, told him what a fan I was of his, uh, his Flash run. Um, 
There we are, that's number 15. So Han Solo finally tracks down Crimson Jack, um, uh, who has previously captured uh, Princess Leia. So um, what happened was Crimson Jack had pinched Han Solo's reward that he got for destroying the Death Star, and they had to go and try and re retrieve it. Um, and during that time, uh, Princess Leia gets um, gets captured, and that's like the uh, the battle to, to save her. All right. Um, this one's quite good, although I have to say, this guy here, the hunter, looks like uh, Reed Richards from the Fantastic Four, even with the uh, slightly graying sideburns there. <laughs> Number 16. Number 17, um, yeah, so this is Crucible, an untold tale of, um, of Luke's history. Um, I think he goes on to uh, um, the Jawa Express, and we even see um, an appearance from uh, Jabba the Hutt, but not the Jabba that we've seen in the later movies. This was the Jabba that was cut from the first film. Um, and we also get to see an early untold story of um, Obi-Wan Kenobi as well in that one. Now, this is interesting. So number 18, The Empire Strikes. Now, this is... Not the Empire Strikes Back. That was just the title of this film, and it's very interesting that they used that title, even though it wasn't actually um, nothing to do with the later movie that was to come. So it's quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, I wonder if they, if someone in Lucas or George Lucas spotted a spotted a copy of this comic and thought, "Oh, that's a good title." Um, then we've got some more generic adventures with the whole team. Um, once again. Nothing to really write home about in these ones. Um, they're not fantastic. You can see they've sort of resolved into uh, uh, the silly monsters with four arms brigade. Um, they do have their charm, however. Um, see, Vader makes an appearance in this one. Um, but they're not, I wouldn't say these are not, cla these are not classic stories, these ones. But basically, the artists and writers are just treading water, literally, until... The Empire Strikes Back comes along. Um, but I think, you know, they managed to keep it going uh, really well when you think about it. Um, but what we've already covered actually was the main the main um, storyline. So this is the um, untold tale of Ben Kenobi there. And they've not got a bad likeness of uh, Alec Guinness. Silent Drifting. I have to imagine if that was a reference to silent running. Um, something else to point out, this is quite a good example. So you see the two different uh, logos there. So we've got number 23 there with the box, and that was an American newsstand copy. And number 24 there with the diamond was one that was sold directly to comic, American comic and speciality shops. So once again, that's yet another, and all the comics exist in two different formats, as well as the overseas version. So you really do have your work cut out if you're a completist. I have known of like X-Men collectors, for example, who just want a particular adaption. They, they want the direct market copies. They don't want the newsstand ones. Others who want it the other way around. Um, it's, it's really interesting, but you know, that to me is being overly fussy. I'm just glad I put a run of these together when I did, because you know, it would be a bit of a tough ask without finding a big job lot with just a few left to fill in, uh, trying to do it today. Um, so there we are, so a mini milestone, number 25. Um, it wasn't too much longer before um, Empire Strikes Back was uh, on the horizon and they were able to start using a bit of uh, new material, having the characters mature, and a few different locations to call on as well, which I guess they were absolutely crying out for. Um, but Star Wars was still on an absolute high. This is Star Wars, the time of Star Wars mania. So I think pretty much anything Star Wars was going to sell, wasn't it? So uh, uh, that's quite a nice, interesting cover. Uh, quite a lot of detail on it. Cavern of the Crawling Death. It was always interesting that they got the human characters, although they're 70, 70 eyes and they're marvelized with the really like muscular bodies. Um, some of the other ones they struggled on. I think Chewbacca was one that was never quite right in these early comics. And the droids as well just didn't, didn't you, they wouldn't get away with it today. Um, however, um, you know, it is still classic Star Wars and it's from the era, so they've got a real sort of charm to it. Um, they were in number 29 there, Dark Encounter. This again, this is a bit of a, a cyborg character, another one sort of borrowed from Marvel's uh, traditional comic universe. 
I remember this one, and I think this one had more of a impact on me reading it in the British Star Wars Weekly than in these. Um, but obviously, these are all in full colour. In the UK, we had Star Wars Weekly when they were black and white, which was a, a bit of always a disappointment, but at least we had a new Star Wars comic every week. Now, these I particularly like, so um, they've, they've got the Jew back there, and they've sort of made it a little bit evil. That is fantastic on a return to Tatooine. Um, Luke defies the Empire on his homeworld. That's pretty cool, isn't it? That's perhaps, I think, one of the best covers we've seen so far, is that one. It really is quite, quite nice, that. I do like that one. And if you're wondering what I keep these um, comics in, they're just in a normal comic backing board. And then these are called Mylar bags. You can get these on, um, on eBay. It's perhaps the easiest way to get them nowadays. I used to sell them in the shop. Um, although they're expensive, they do not uh, degrade over time like a traditional comic bag. So these have got a lifetime guarantee. And I've had these on these comics for, well, since I've put a run together in the late 80s. Um, you know, so I've had them on here for over 30 years now. And they're, at, they're as good as the day I put them into their into the sleeves. So, yeah, Mylar bags, that's what they're called, and they come recommended. I'm trying to get these so they don't reflect. The only issue with them is they are highly reflective. So hopefully uh, that's not spoiled this video too much. Um, number 33 here, Sabre Clash. Once again, this looks like a funked up Doctor Strange or something, doesn't it? But... It is what it is, it's of the period. And you'll find with some of the Star Wars comics, if you do want to get them in high grade, a lot of them have got like this one, they've got black covers. And a black covered comic is always harder to find without like spine creases and that, because they show up so easily. That's number 34 here. Thunder in the Stars. 35, The Dark Lord's Gambit. So here's number 36, and uh, once again, a pretty awful cover, to be honest. You know, this great big uh, pink unicorn tiger thing. I mean, pretty awful. Uh, 37, in Mortal Kombat, this looks quite, quite good fun, though I don't quite remember the storyline of that one. Then the very last one, before The Empire Strikes Back comes along, was this one, number 38, Riders in the Void. So I imagine by this time the uh, writers now sort of breathed a huge sigh of relief. A few we can start, uh, we've got, finally got something new that we can adapt. And uh, that will be the subject of the very next video. Um. So there you go, I hope you enjoyed this first look at these Marvel comics. If you have enjoyed the video, do please give it a thumbs up. Um, which ones do you remember reading as a kid, or did you just have the British Star Wars Weekly? Let me know in the comments down below. Thank you once again for watching, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.